Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for Monday, March 20th, 2017. Happy first day of spring to you. Um, astronomical spring begins today, so that's good news. If you like warmth, I do, so hopefully we can get a warm rest of March and into April going for areas here in the eastern U.S. and uh, say goodbye to winter. It was 32 degrees Fahrenheit at the office this morning. I was like, yeah, that's fitting for the first day of spring. But I digress. Let's take a look at the sea surface temperature anomalies for today, updating on the 20th. So we are right on time. You notice here in the eastern Pacific in the Nino 1-2 area, as it's called, or often referred to, pretty warm anomalies here, two and a half, almost three degrees Celsius above the long-term average. And that has contributed to some Heavy rainfall here along parts of the west coast of South America, Peru in particular. You might have heard about that in the news, and maybe that warm water and the additional moisture added to the local atmospheric state in that region contributing to that somewhat. In the central Pacific, in the Nino 3-4 area, some cool anomalies persisting along the surface. We'll take a look at the subsurface in just a moment. In the Atlantic Basin, a little bit more of a chopped up look to things. Colder patches in here, but this is all up in the subtropics. The deep tropics down here, not particularly warm, not particularly cold compared to average. Just a little area through here that's slightly warmer. And most of the Gulf of Mexico running above the long-term average. This little blue area curiously hanging on. I have not found an explanation as to why that has been so persistent this winter when the rest of the Gulf has been at record levels. So go figure, right? I, I just I can't figure it out. That should be where the loop current is located. Uh, and so why is it running significantly? I mean, it's got some dark blue in there. So that's, you know, we're looking at some anomalies over here, maybe two degrees Celsius below the average. So can't figure out why, but there it is. And notice up here, too, You've gotten some more blues kind of thrown in with all this. It, again, it looks like it's I'm trying to figure out what the, uh, it's not a patchwork, but it's definitely blotchy. That's the word I'm looking for. It's blotchy. You've got blotches of oranges and reds and blotches of deep blues thrown in for good measure. Why? Well, we've had a pretty stormy pattern across this region over the last few weeks, and that has helped to mix up the Northwest Atlantic to some degree. And so it's cooled off those anomalies as well. And uh, so really no big changes in the overall map. Uh, if we look at the base state, the SOI, now this is interesting in, you know, to some extent. Uh, if we look at the daily contributor, 2.73. The 90-day, remember last time we talked, I said keep an eye on the 90-day. And that is basically hovering right around zero. It's just 0.11 right now. But look what's happened with the last 30 days. Uh, the last time I did this video, about a week ago, this was negative 2 and some change, and the February number was negative 2. And now we have risen and certainly added to this. It's gone up. So basically the SOI, the index, has increased since the last time, you know, basically over the last week. And it's going to fluctuate. I know that. But it's going up. It's not going down consistently or persistently okay and that's important because as long as this stays near zero or neutral and even positive by a couple of points then we're not going to be transitioning into a pattern that supports el nino all right because you've really got to have a lower overall pressure in the soi to get your el nino state to change the enso state anyway and if we look at the subsurface, this is interesting as well. Uh, again, just sort of islands of heat in the subsurface here. Uh, the eastern Pacific is where most of it is. Uh, and then, you know, just this little area of cool holding on. But overall, there's a lot more neutral or white color in here. And this is way down at depth. Uh, and even over here, then you have anything else. All right, so we're not developing, again, this enormous blob of warm anomaly sticking out like this with different gradations, you know, looking down here of, uh, of color, you know, extending 
east from west to east like we saw in 2015 as an example. And I know that each El Nino setup is different, and comparing it to 2015 might not be fair, but that's the most recent El Nino event. It's obviously just two years old, if that. And so to me, it's fresh in my mind. Well, that's what an El Nino looks like. And this really, I mean, look, these water temperatures, yeah, they're running above normal, but they're more than 100 meters deep. <laughs> There's real no mechanism to get this water to come up to the surface. Furthermore, we're not seeing a large building area of warm anomalies in the western Pacific. No, what we call downwelling of the warm Pacific pool as it is. It's all very complicated, but when you boil it down and you look at a simple graphic like this, I say it often, this tells us the future. And right now I don't see any big indications that a warm episode is imminent. Um, you know, again, could it be warm neutral? Maybe. Uh, but let's, so let's just go through some of these charts that have updated recently. This is the mid-March uh, plume of the model predictions for ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. That's what that stands for. And we have the different averages here. Okay, the dynamical average, which are the more sophisticated, robust computer models. For example, the European, the System 4, uh, the CFS V2, and others. Okay, these are your more complicated, uh, dynamical, sophisticated computer models. These are your statistical, more of a simple statistical average. And then you have your CPC, or your Climate Prediction Center, your consensus, this sort of purple color that I drew red over. Right. So these are the different averages in your consensus. And if we look at the dynamical average, and it tends to do pretty well, I guess, it's fairly robust in getting towards El Nino thresholds by August, September, October, which is right here. That's the heart of hurricane season. And you see the intersection there. Yeah, right around one degree Celsius. But the statistical and the consensus here are fairly well below that right here and then right here. In fact, the consensus drops off September, October, November. It starts to drop off thereafter. So again, there's real... Uh, doubt in my mind at least that we're going to get an El Nino event at all much less anything substantial I just it's not happening yet we're not seeing we're getting close enough to April and yes I know we're going through what we call the predictability barrier a fancy way of saying this time of year the models struggle trying to see that far out and a lot of different things can happen during the intra-seasonal changes that are going on right now so we call that you know the predictability barrier, there's a name for everything, and yeah, we're passing through that time period, but we're not seeing any significant westerly wind bursts. Again, the SOI, you know, the 90 day is still positive, so there you go. So anyway, that's a look at the CPC IRI. This is the Euro, as I was talking about, the System 4. Uh, exactly what does that mean? I couldn't tell you precisely. Different uh, version of the model, I guess you could say. And I believe it has 50 plus members. And that's what you're looking at. All these different runs of the ensemble group. I wish that it would plot a mean, an ensemble mean, an average. But let's just look at some of the extremes here, though, shall we? And this will show you why I have some doubt, okay? Some of the members are Katie bar the door. The globe is going to be too warm for us to live in ridiculously warm close to three degrees celsius uh in the nino 3.4 area by august and september um if that happens <laughs> i shouldn't laugh because it would be horrific okay bad 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 implications if that were to happen conversely some of the members uh by the peak of season bring us steadily into la nina and there's about what three members right there Several more members definitely lowering it, and then you got a bunch more in the middle. Eh, whatever, it's just a it's a mess. Um, it's divergent. That's what it is. That's a great way to describe this. From the outlier on the top of the chart to the outlier on the bottom, and then this huge spread in between. Yeah, it's you know <laughs> nobody knows. Okay, it's going to be interesting. So I want to show you this because. You know, I guess if you tried to eyeball some kind of a, a median in here, I don't know, maybe like that. Let's just assume 
that the average is close to a degree Celsius, you know, really into the El Nino threshold. All right? That's important for what I'm going to show you next. Now, the latest System 4 European pressure output, very recently, uh, from the start date of the 1st of March. Okay, so this was initialized, see it right there, 0103.17. You know, they do their numbers backwards or whatever uh, in Europe, right? So the, the day is first, then the month, then the year. So it's March 1st was the initial date. And what are we looking at? Well, these are all these reds through here are higher than normal sea surface pressures, sea level pressure. The blues are lower sea level pressure. So the easiest way to think of this map, this map says that the Atlantic during the July, August, September time frame will have generally higher than normal sea level pressure. And the Pacific, especially the Central Pacific out here, fairly substantial, lower than normal sea level pressure. Now, I would love to know, does this particular map here rely on this verifying? Because if this is wrong, and let's say that we actually come in, you know, something like this, where it's just warm neutral at best, so to speak, then how is this going to be right? Because warmer sea, ter uh, sea level let me calm down. Warmer sea surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific would translate to lower sea level pressure, uh, whereas cooler uh, sea surface temperatures usually translate into higher sea level pressure, but they're not always completely connected. And so it just begs the question, at least for me, and hopefully other people are asking as well, what if this is way off, then would this be way off? I don't know. It's just something to think about. Um, so we'll see. Each month this gets updated. And you bet once, once we get into April, I'm going to jump all over this. And let's see how this changes, <clears throat> if at all. All right, so let's move on to just a few more interesting tidbits here. Um, spring breakers, if there's still spring break going on, shelf waters warming up, but, you know, nothing substantial yet. At least uh, in some portions of Texas coastal waters, we're talking about the low to almost the mid-70s. But the 80-degree line, 26 Celsius, still way down here in the southeast Gulf. Things, though, are you know moving along. Um, next month, April 9th, somewhere around there, in South Padre Island is the National Tropical Weather Conference. I will be going to that and speaking there. And by then, the water temperatures will hopefully be, you know, almost 80 degrees. That'd be kind of nice. Maybe I can... Put my toe in the gulf down there. The Atlantic, uh, Western Atlantic, again, we've had some storms coming off here, churning up the Western Atlantic here, uh, but the Gulf Stream alive and well. Uh, as I showed you, this is kind of a mishmash of uh, different mixing going on up here because of the storminess that we have had. I think once things sort of reverse and we get high pressure dominating back over the Western Atlantic again or off the Southwest Atlantic, then we'll see these sea surface temperatures begin to warm up again, and those anomalies will probably come back <clears throat> because, you know, down here in the southwest Atlantic and in the Gulf, the water temperatures are much above normal, and that's what helps to feed the Gulf Stream uh, all in all. Anyway, that's it for the tropics. Let's move on to lower 48 weather. This will be fairly brief here. The map is generally quiet. You know, it certainly has been much busier recently especially a week ago, uh, and we um, don't really have any major storms coming through. Sort of a few upper-level low-pressure areas, these bowling balls of energy that will come through. Uh, not quite a zonal flow setting up, but we're not digging these giant troughs of cold air down into the nation's midsection or the eastern part of the country either. So it's going to be more of a transitional period coming up. Uh, progressive is a good way to put it. That being said, the risk of severe weather starts to increase as we move through the next few days here. This is the day one outlook, and so this would be valid. Um, I guess this comes, this is today, right? Yeah. So really no big severe thunderstorm uh, risk at the moment. Uh, tomorrow, if this will load for me, uh, the same is generally true. A little bit more action here in parts of uh, Tennessee 
and maybe northern Alabama, parts of the southeast, okay? But we're not seeing a major setup just yet. Dew points just aren't quite there yet. We're not seeing a strong, basically we need a big old high pressure sitting out here and strong southerly flow coming in like this to advect or move laterally the warm Gulf air. And then you need energy coming down with dry air out of Canada. Those meet up over this area and then you get your big severe weather outbreaks. We're not seeing that type of pattern, thank goodness, just yet. So that's good news because you know it's coming. Probably going to be a pretty big season as well as we get into April and May. But we can talk about that when it gets here. All right, so pretty lengthy today. Got a lot to talk about. See, it just shows you that even though it's not hurricane season, there's still plenty to discuss. And it's fun. I like keeping on top of this stuff and kind of seeing how the mystery is going to work itself out because we don't know six months ahead of time or whatever what the hurricane season is going to be like. You get all these puzzle pieces along the way, but the puzzle pieces themselves morph and change over time so that keeps it interesting to say the least all right well thanks for tuning in as always and uh, any new subscribers to our youtube channel i welcome you and i appreciate you tuning in and uh for the folks that have been here all along as always i appreciate you listening and hopefully learning from me as i present at least what i know and uh, if you got any questions leave them in the comments i try to answer what i can if not in the comments then certainly at the next discussion it's always fun to do that the feedback is phenomenal. That's the one big thing that I really like about this format is almost that instant feedback from people all over the world. I really like it. <clears throat> all right. Have a great rest of your Monday and a great rest of your week ahead. I'm Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com. Again, thanks for tuning in, and I'll talk to you again next week.